Up today we go to Israel and here's a quote that is absolutely unbelievable. To set fire in the West Bank and to fuel the flames. Well, that's what Iran has openly declared to do to Israel. And already this year, Israeli security forces have foiled more than 300 terror plots. Break the Wave is the name of the counterterrorism operation that Israel has launched in response to the surge of attacks. Julie Stahl has the details. The director of Israel's Shin Bet Secret Service says there's been an upsurge in Palestinian terror attacks this year. We foiled 312 significant terrorist attacks, stabbings, shootings, suicide attacks, and have made 2,000 arrests. Speaking at a counterterrorism summit, Ronen Barr pointed to a massive increase in shooting attacks against Israeli troops and civilians in the West Bank. As Israel heads to its fifth election in three years, Barr says the instability has led to more attacks. From the intelligence that we have read, from the investigations of attackers we have conducted, and also from many years of familiarity with our adversaries, wherever they are, we can say today without a shadow of a doubt, the political instability, the growing internal division, are an encouragement to the axes of evil, to the terror organizations and individual attackers. Barr says the rift developing in Israeli society is the most complex challenge Israel is facing. Israel's enemies, he says, believe Israel's national resilience is fading. In an operation called Break the Wave, the IDF stepped up its counterterrorism raids in Palestinian areas a few months ago. According to Israel's public broadcaster Khan, that led to a warning from Egypt urging Israel to back off, saying it worries about an escalation and possibly the situation spinning out of control. Barr calls Iran the underlying problem, a sentiment echoed by former Israeli intelligence officer Avi Melamed. The Iranian regime says openly that their intention is to set fire in the West Bank and to uh, fuel the flames in the West Bank. According to Melamed, another contributing factor behind the violence is that the Palestinian Authority is at a crossroads. The term of the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, seemingly is towards the end. There is already an ongoing process where potential rivalries are kind of like taking positions. There is a lot of weapon in the West Bank. Should Abbas leave the picture, Melamed describes one scenario being a power vacuum leading to an internal armed struggle between Palestinian factions. And even now, there's weakening of the Palestinian Authority's sovereignty in parts of the West Bank in places like Jenin, Hebron and Nablus. This is a very alarming process and this is, by the way, one of the major reasons Israel is constantly and recently increasingly intercept that phenomenon and particularly in those hubs or pockets. According to Barr, the PA security forces need to be strengthened in order to restore calm, and their public wants that too. But it's up to the PA to do it. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, the ideology is what's really fueling this, and it's an ideology of destruction. Uh, children, grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren have been raised in this ideology that they need to drive Israel into the sea, and they need to wipe Israel off the map. They have no concept of a two-state solution. They don't want it at all. They've never even tried to build for it. What they want is Israel to go away. They want to go back to something that they can't ever go back to. And when you look at the history of this region, whether it was under the Ottomans or under the British Mandate or under Jordan and Transjordan, uh, there was never this independent state uh, for, for centuries. And so it just, it, it literally makes no sense to me. We have to look at that ideology and call it out for what it is, and it's evil, and it's absolutely being fueled by Iran. Uh, they're funding Hezbollah, they're funding Hamas, they're trying to incite violence and kill Jews. That's what's behind all of this. There's another thing going on, and I just feel that we need to call it out. It's the political instability in Israel. Uh, the number of elections that they've had uh, is actually emboldening their enemies to say, let's take advantage of them while they're weak and while they're divided. 
My prayer and my hope for both Israel and the United States is that we would find a way to get through these political divides and, and realize it's worth it. It's worth it for the freedom of the world. It's worth it to have a free and stable Israel. It's worth it to have a free and stable United States. Well, in other news, uh, we're going to New England now. Long known as the playground of the rich and famous, Martha's Vineyard has now become the latest battleground in the fight over illegal immigration. Ephraim Graham has that story and more from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis flew about 50 undocumented Venezuelan migrants from Texas to Martha's Vineyard this week. He said the goal is to protect Florida from the consequences of President Biden's open border policies. If you have folks that are inclined to think Florida is a good place, our message to them is we are not a sanctuary state and it's better to be able to go to a sanctuary jurisdiction. And yes, we will help facilitate that transport for you to be able to go to greener pastures. Thursday, buses dropped off two groups of migrants from Texas near the vice president's home in Washington, D.C. After Vice President Kamala Harris twice declared the border was secure in an interview Sunday. The administration blasted the moves, but one Texas lawmaker said this is what border states deal with every day. Republican governors interfering in that process and using migrants as political pawns is, uh, is shameful, is reckless, and just plain wrong. They are beginning to experience just a little bit of what the state of Texas and other border uh, communities have experienced for years. Immigration is a big election issue in this year's midterms and the 2004 presidential race. So far, more than two million people have crossed the southern border illegally this year. A federal judge approved former President Trump's pick to independently review documents taken from his Florida home. New York Judge Raymond Deary will serve as the special master. He'll go through the 11,000 documents seized by the FBI. Trump's legal team claims some are protected by attorney-client privilege and executive privilege. The judge also ruled against the Department of Justice's request to resume its use of the classified documents in its investigation. Turning now to international affairs, Russian President Vladimir Putin met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping Thursday. It was the first meeting between the two since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In a surprising public statement, Putin acknowledged Xi Jinping had questions and concerns about the conflict. He did not mention the war, but said China remains committed to Russia's core interests. The war in Ukraine is having far-reaching consequences. Russia's dwindling influence is leading to flare-ups of violence in former Soviet nations, including the world's first official Christian country, Armenia. Chuck Holton has this story. Just after midnight on September 13th, Azerbaijan launched a large-scale attack against its neighbor, Armenia. It's the latest battle in a long-running conflict between the Muslim-majority Azerbaijan and Armenia, a country that claims to be the world's first Christian nation. But the attacks on Sunday have more to do with money than with religion. It's the worst attack since 2020 when Nazeri forces pushed into the exclave of Artsakh, taking lands populated by Armenians since the time of Noah. CBN was there to witness how the Azeri military put little stock in the value of civilian lives. So you see this car right here it was hit by cluster munitions. All of these little holes are uh, from the thousands of projectiles that are thrown out by these things. They are definitely not meant for civilian areas. They're meant for troops in the open. The most recent attack looks to be no different. We have several civilians wounded. The attacks were not only against Armenian military positions, but there were attacks against Armenian civilian towns and villages. Several homes have been damaged, including municipal buildings. So it was an attack against military and civilian infrastructure. In the current conflict, Azeris aren't attacking a remote area, but Armenia proper. And the objectives have everything to do with the current war in Ukraine. People here in Armenia are understandably disturbed by the images they see coming out of Ukraine, but it's difficult for them to take a stand against Russia when Russia is the only country that stands between Armenia and their enemies to the east in Azerbaijan. It's extremely, extremely uh, 
concerning because they are attacking the sovereign territory of the Republic of Armenia, uh, escalating uh, this situation, uh, this theater of hostilities to an all-time high, and it's a very, very dangerous situation at the moment. The reason they want that is that is the connector between Azerbaijan and the autonomous country of Nakhchivan to Turkey. And that will allow them to have a pipeline of oil. Indeed, Western leaders have been meeting recently with Azerbaijan's president to discuss how to get more of the country's oil to make up the shortfalls from Russia this winter. That may have emboldened the Azeris to make this move. I think this is about money. I think this is about uh, uh, taking those lands right now, because that's where the majority of the attacks are happening. The U.S. government has so far refrained from condemning the attacks, calling instead on both parties to return to the negotiating table. There can be no military solution to this conflict. We urge restraint from any further military hostilities. We also encourage both governments to reestablish direct lines of communications across diplomatic and military channels uh, and to recommit uh, to a diplomatic process uh, to, resolve the, uh, to resolve the crisis. Armenia relies on Russian peacekeepers to uphold a 2020 ceasefire. Given the distraction of the war in Ukraine, Russia may be unable to keep a lid on the hostilities here. That runs the risk of pulling Iran into the conflict, which moved troops to the border on Monday, saying it would not stand for any change in Armenia's territorial borders. While Azerbaijan desperately seeks a path for its oil to the west, many Armenian Christians see something deeper with the current conflict. I believe this is a spiritual attack. This is a spiritual battle that has been stirred up uh, against them. So pray for the strength and the faith and that the gospel will continue to go forth here in Armenia and that it will go forth in these countries that are attacking because that is the only way we'll have peace is in Jesus Christ. I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Much prayer is needed indeed. Gordon? Much prayer is needed, and all Christians around the world should wake up to what's going on in Armenia. Years, just a few years ago in, in that war, um, uh, Azerbaijan had an absolute advantage because they had drone technology, and they were able to zero in on the uh, Armenian troops and, and won victory after victory in the battlefield. Russia stepped in and said, no, we, we, we've got to recognize these borders. Uh, they said, we'll provide peacekeepers. Um, it's a, such a contrast to what they're doing in Ukraine. It just, it seems like they're two different countries at work here. But we need to say, no, let's respect international boundaries. Uh, it's been a fundamental of international law since the League of Nations, since Pre President Woodrow Wilson, that you have a right of self-determination. Armenia has been an independent country for literally thousands of years. Uh, and let us re reinforce their right to be an independent, free nation. Jane's Revenge. It's one of many threatening messages spray-painted on crisis pregnancy centers across the nation. Even worse, more than 60 centers have been firebombed or vandalized. Workers at these nonprofit clinics and the women who need their services are at risk, especially in blue states like Massachusetts. Well, Heather Sells reports. Not long after the historic abortion ruling, extremists attacked this crisis pregnancy center in Worcester. They spray painted Jane's revenge on the sidewalk and smash the windows. And the police were here waiting for us. Director Kelly Wilcox says the intent was clear. They're trying to put us out of business by attacking us. An hour away in Revere, vandals spray painted this center, leaving messages that put both staff and patients on notice. We were concerned because that's a direct threat. Crisis pregnancy centers in blue states like Massachusetts are facing uncharted waters. Backlash in the aftermath of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade and the possibility of more restrictions on their work. Instead of any kind of protection plan, municipalities like Worcester are considering ordinances to penalize these centers for what opponents call misleading communication. And the state's attorney general, Maura Healy, has doubled down with a consumer advisory. It maintains that most centers are not licensed medical facilities 
that unlicensed staff perform ultrasounds and that they often provide inaccurate and misleading information about abortion. Deception is at the heart of the typical CPC's business model. Adding fuel to the fire is the state's own Senator Elizabeth Warren. CPCs often lure women seeking legitimate reproductive care, including abortions, into their facilities. In August, Warren introduced the Anti-Abortion Disinformation Act, designed to target CPCs nationwide. Having to make a choice without all the information is not pro-woman. Clinic directors like Teresa Larkin and Kelly Wilcox dispute the charges of deception and misinformation. They say their mission is to educate women in crisis about all of their options with peer-reviewed scientific facts. They have to have good information to make a good decision. Both clinics, like many others, explain online and on their consent forms that they do not provide or refer for abortions. For women wanting a choice, they offer a medical pregnancy test, an ultrasound to determine how far along they are, and consultations to discuss their options. Many of these women face economic hurdles and what is known as reproductive coercion. We have people just, their parents won't pay for college if they have a baby, or, hey, I'm going to break up with you if you have this baby. Three in 10 Clearway clients do choose abortion. Some, like Courtney, have chosen both abortion and life. Even when I reached back out to them and told them that I did not keep my pregnancy, they still embraced me and still stayed in touch with me. Courtney decided to keep her next child, a daughter, and says she hopes Clearway will stay in Worcester despite city and state pressure. There's girls who really do need places like this, and it, it's the thing that empowers them, and it's the last stop that gives them that grain of hope that they long for. NIFLA, a national organization for crisis pregnancy centers, says they provide incredible benefits for communities, $280 million worth of free support services each year. And of its 1,600 members, 1,400 are medical facilities. Pregnancy centers that provide medical services absolutely have medical providers. NIFLA Council Ann O'Connor says only licensed staff provide medical services like ultrasounds, and she counters other allegations made by Massachusetts officials. We're not deceptively advertising, so I'm not aware of any prosecution against any pregnancy center in any of those locales. Mark Rienzi, the president of Beckett, a religious freedom law firm in Washington, D.C., says if there is evidence, officials can prosecute with consumer laws already on the books. Ultimately, look, if the attorney general has evidence that someone's actually been defrauded, that someone's been harmed, that somebody practiced medicine without a license, that somebody engaged in actual false advertising, Massachusetts already bans all those things. They're already illegal. And I'm sure there are plenty of prosecutors who would be eager to prosecute uh, pregnancy centers who engaged in them. And Rienzi warns that both blue and red states must be mindful of First Amendment rights for everyone. The First Amendment is designed to stop governments from picking just one side of a debate, declaring it to be true, and punishing the other side. For now, both Larkin and Wilcox are ramping up security, and they're making their case by reaching out to local and state officials. We cannot just serve women and families. We've got to get out in the community and educate our lawmakers about who we are and how we bring such a benefit. Reporting in Massachusetts, Heather Sells, CBN News. Occasionally, stories really make me mad, and this one has made me mad. For a sitting attorney general to say, I'm going to use the power of my office, and there's no factual evidence uh, none whatsoever. If you think going to a crisis pregnancy center that you're going to get an abortion, what, what, there, there's no false advertising here. It is a pregnancy center. We want to see you pregnant. Uh, and that is the, the whole goal here. Uh, for Elizabeth Warren, it, it just makes no sense. Why are you inciting violence across the nation with your commentary? Uh, I don't get it. Let's turn our attention to Planned Parenthood. Is there anything false in that name? Are they ever trying to have you be a parent? 
The answer is clearly no, it's an abortion clinic. And we've gone through the misinformation about Planned Parenthood again and again and again. Just go back in recent history and all of the redo about Margaret Sanger. Was she racist? Was she trying to create some kind of superior race, a thoroughbred race? There was all this kind of redo uh, about her legacy and what she really believed. And then the facts really come out. Yes, indeed, she said to the New York Times, we're trying to create a race of thoroughbreds. We're trying to weed out undesirables. And that's why when today, when you see Planned Parenthood clinics, please take a note of the neighborhoods they put them in. Uh, there's a very definite intent to that. To say Planned Parenthood provides needed medical services, and they listed mammograms. Uh, and then it turns out, well, most of them don't do mammograms. They were trying to maintain their federal funding. And again, it was misinformation. It was confusing. And, uh, you know, but here's the ultimate one. Are they really selling fetal tissue? And you get these documentaries that show, yes, indeed, they are. And then who gets prosecuted? Uh, the person who made the documentary. Uh, Planned Parenthood got a free pass for doing that. So where's the deception? Uh, where's the misinformation? Well, just look at that name, Planned Parenthood. Parenthood has nothing to do with it. We need to come together for these crisis pregnancy centers uh, as the nation goes into this incredible political debate over what do we believe as a people? Do we believe in life? Do we want to protect unborn children? Do we want to encourage families? Do we want to help pregnant women have children? Do we want that? As we go through that debate, let us as Christians come together to support the crisis pregnancy centers across the nation. They are now having to put budget numbers. They're all nonprofits. There is no profit making to any one of them. They're all nonprofits. They depend on donors for support. And right now they have to take those donor dollars and buy security systems and have security personnel to protect their staff and to protect the women who are coming to them for help. Uh, we need to support them. Let's come together and do that. Steve nearly went flat broke trying to get his salsa business off the ground. After four years of struggling, he doubted it would ever be successful. Then Steve answered a knock at his door, and today his salsa sales have skyrocketed in excess of $3 million. The extraordinary story of the original Red Cactus Salsa started with a conversation. In 1994-95 was when the Lord all of a sudden spoke to my heart one morning and said, you know, I want you to do a salsa business. I'm like, a salsa business? You know, he's like, yeah, you know, the one in your family, the sweet salsa, I'd like you to put that on the market. I'm like, well, you know, Lord, I don't know anything about sweet salsa. Undaunted, Steve Lindbauer and his mom worked on perfecting his Aunt Gracie's old family recipe. Young, unmarried, and a new Christian with a promising career as an insurance supervisor, Steve hadn't been looking for a new direction. That's until he got laid off. He used all his savings and severance to manufacture the product. I loaded up my trunk and put some some 12 packs of product into the back and I started calling just on grocery stores. Two years later, struggling with low cash flow and doubt, Steve wavered about what he heard. I had almost went broke trying to take care of bills. Sales were good, but I wasn't for sure how to quite get it out there and grow it. And I was also a young guy wanting to start a family. And I finally just screamed out at the Lord. I'm like, Lord, what are we doing? I'm like, I'm going flat broke. I've got a degree. I could be making money. Now look at me. Look at me now. Steve took a job to support himself and worked his salsa business before and after his nine to five. After two more years of long hours and endless miles on the road, a knock on his door brought the solution to his problems. A friend's brother shared with him a life-changing principle. Then out of the blue, he said, Steve, I don't think you're tithing. And as a servant of the Lord, you need to start tithing. You know, I had that look. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. And I don't. And you're right. I should. It was just like an eye opener. I mean, the Lord tells us to give up our first fruit. He tells us in Malachi to tithe. Steve decided he was going to tithe. Four years later, 
Red Cactus Salsa was fully supporting his growing family. I was tithing and even probably going beyond the tithe. In 2003, I was making around 40,000 and I was able to tie 4,700 every year that I continually gave. My salary continued to go up to be able to bring up four kids. And not only that, I mean, it's more than just even my salary. I mean, the blessings of family and, and children and just spiritual blessings, so many things that he gives. He far surpasses out, gives us back. Every year, the demand for the salsa grew. The company expanded with more products, office space, and a warehouse. In 2016, Steve began tithing off the business profits. But you know, we can't outgive him, and I believe, you know, if we support him and the work of getting his name out there, that um, somehow he, he takes care of us because he cares about us so much. I know that in my now 26 years of doing this, we have been told by the accounts and even the bigger accounts we go to that it, it must be an act of God for us to do what we do because we're just a little old salsa that was out of a little old town that now is you know, covering half of the nation. During lockdown, when the world binged on Netflix and snacks, Red Cactus Salsa sales skyrocketed to $3 million. Steve's income increased 40%. By the time 2020 was over and we're moving into 2021, Red Cactus at that point was doing so well, I mean like crazy well, that we were beginning to become debt free and no longer have to operate on a loan. While other snack products lost sales momentum in 2021, Red Cactus maintained their new all-time high. If not even increase more, so everything that we gained in 2020 continued to go. And I believe all that was for the fact that we stayed our stance in God, kept the tithe, and kept moving forward in Him. God always somehow honors those that honor Him. In January 2022, Steve was hospitalized with COVID. While recovering at home, he discovered the 700 Club and Operation Blessing. It's incredible to see how much they're doing, you know, and I thought as a person and as a business, we love to feed the hungry right here in our community. Here's a group that is feeding the hungry on a worldwide level. I thought, what a great deal. I instantly, that moment, got online, put in my monthly pledge and began to put it on there. And all I can tell you is after I did that, I had the, like, the warmest feeling come over me. Like the first time I learned to tithe and I finally just did it and my life was blessed. If I've learned anything along the way is you cannot outgive him. He tells us to tithe, not that he has to have our money, but it's more of a hard issue that if we do it, it opens us up to him and everything that he can do and he will do because he promises to take care of us. He does promise to take care of us and there's uh, conditions to that. And he says, if you will only obey me and let me help you, then you'll have plenty. That comes from the book of Isaiah. Here's Steve. God gives him an idea. How about making a sweet salsa? That's a kind of an unusual communication from God. It was certainly struck Steve as unusual, but he said, okay, I'll obey you. I'll do that. Uh, but then as in the course of time, he realized he wasn't fully obeying God because he wasn't putting God first with his finances. It's not that God needs our money, but he does need our heart. What is our heart set on? Is our security in our bank account? Is our security in our income? Is our security in a retirement account? Where's your security? If your security is with God, then you'll do what Proverbs says to do. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with, well, in Steve's case, with salsa. In your case, it can be new wine. Let your vats overflow. How do you get that? By giving God first, by saying, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to set aside 10% of my income. I'm going to give it away. Not from a sense of obligation, not from a sense of duty. I want to do it cheerfully. I want to be part of God's plan. I want to make sure the kingdom of God advances. I want to put his kingdom first. I want to put my treasure where I know it's never going to decay, that God is going to be able to use it and use it to preach the gospel around the world. If you want to do all of that, just like Steve, join the 700 Club. 
He saw us feeding people around the world, and a portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing to do that. Millions of pounds of food are being delivered to food banks across the nation right here in the United States, and we're helping people in India, the Philippines, Indonesia, Africa, Latin America. You're a part of all of it when you join the 700 Club. If you want to see the gospel preached around the world, a portion of every gift goes into the work of CBN International to do just that. You're a part of everything we do. So if you want to join, call us now, 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I want to join the 700 Club. Now that's $20 a month. We have higher levels, 700 Club, gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. And our way of saying thank you for joining the 700 Club is to send you a copy of a wonderful teaching on the Lord is my shepherd. Now, if you join at 700 Club, we'll send you one copy. If you join at 700 Club Gold, we'll send you three copies. If you join at 1,000 Club, we'll send you five copies. So you can share this teaching with your family, with your friends, and you can be part of sharing the gospel. And it's a teaching. It's based on the, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, Psalm 23. It's called, again, The Lord is My Shepherd. I want to do a meditation on the Psalm of David, Psalm 23. Gordon Robertson presents The Lord is My Shepherd, a Psalm of David. Each verse is a guide for us in our life. And it's a beautiful illustration for me of how Jesus leads us. What happens when we fully embrace the Lord is my shepherd? Get the Lord is my shepherd, the latest audio teaching from Gordon Robertson. Call now or go to CBN.com. Elmer cried when his baby was born, but they were not tears of joy. His son was born with club feet, and Elmer knew he could never afford the surgery his son needed. Elmer and his wife, Rosa, were devastated to learn that their firstborn son, Christopher, was born with club feet. I went outside and cried. I watched how the parents were going home with their healthy babies. It was very difficult. The first thing I thought was that my son would never be able to walk with his feet like that. Club feet affects a child's feet and ankle bones, muscles, tendons, and blood vessels. Christopher's case was so severe that the bottoms of his feet turned sideways. The doctor urged the family to schedule surgery right away. But with the operation costing more than $2,000, Elmer knew they could never afford it. I did not know how we could get such a large amount of money. Elmer works as a security guard in Honduras and only earns about $300 a month, not enough for the procedure to repair his son's feet. I could think of nothing else except Christopher's feet. Then Rosa remembered hearing about Operation Blessing at the hospital. So they called and asked if we could help. They opened the doors for us so that we could have hope that our child would one day walk normally. Soon, Operation Blessing arranged for Christopher to receive the surgery and casting needed to correct the misalignment in his feet and ankles. I am thankful to God for the people who did this surgery for my son. I thank my God because he touched people's hearts so they would help us. It's now been a few weeks since the surgery and doctors are optimistic that Christopher will be able to walk normally. Thank God for the people who have given us this help for our baby. Thanks to God and Operation Blessing. I love the tender hearts of these parents who are just so desperate for their son to be able to walk one day. I'm also grateful for your hearts if you're 700 Club members because you have the kind of compassion that says, I can make a difference and I want to make a difference. We want to say thank you for joining the 700 Club. Today is the day where we're asking you to do as much as you can so that we can reach out to even more families like the little family you just saw. So many needs all around the world and 700 Club members are touching so many of them. Will you join with us? If you haven't joined the 700 Club already, a general member Membership is 65 cents a day, $20 a month. But look at this. 
you have options. Maybe you're already a 700 Club member. Would you consider going up to 700 Club Gold with a gift of $40 or more a month? Or you could become a 1,000 Club member at $84 a month. You can see our 2,500 Club members, they join us at $2,500 a year. That works out to $209 a month. Or become a founder. $417 a month is a gift of $5,000 a year. Ask God what he'd have you to do because he really does bless us when we allow the things that are on his heart to become the things that are on our hearts. And meeting the needs of people who are hurting like this little family and so many others, people who don't have clean drinking water. And with all of the things that you reach out and do, we bring the message of God's love. You can hear it in the stories that they tell. We say thank you and we say please go to your phone and call now and do as much as you can. Our number's toll free, it's right there on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I wanna join the 700 Club. We have a wonderful gift for you when you do. It's Gordon's latest teaching, The Lord is My Shepherd. You're going to love this. This is such a, a loved psalm for many, many decades, really. Thousands of years people have been enjoying the words of David. We want you to enjoy them too. Gordon teaches us all the deep meaning of that psalm for us as believers. So it's our gift to you when you call right now, 1-800-700-7000. Gordon? Well, Brenda Kelly lost her husband. Then she lost everything she owned. Brenda is an 89-year-old widow whose belongings were wiped out by the Kentucky floods. And here's how you helped her rebuild her life. When Eastern Kentucky was struck by heavy rain and dangerous flooding, for many people, the water came with little warning. It came fast. If we'd waited too much longer, we probably wouldn't have made it out. We watched the water keep coming, keep coming. It got up on my house to here. Brenda's an 89-year-old widow without much of an income. And now to go with no husband, no, nothing. That's all I have. Brenda lost a lot, but she managed to keep her loved ones safe. The night of the flood, she had family staying over. We had three of our great-grandchildren here. We loaded them in a car. That's where we stayed till it was over. And I tried to tell them, we've got each other. Operation Blessing quickly mobilized to help families in Eastern Kentucky take their first steps toward recovery. Volunteers arrived at Brenda's house, ripped up damaged floors, and tore out flood-soaked drywall. Operation Blessing is a blessing. They've worked so hard today, and it is so hot. They've moved stuff out. They've carried garbage. They've worked so, so hard. Operation Blessing also brought the family emergency meal kits, water, and cleaning supplies to help them get back on their feet. They have to love people and love the Lord to do things like that for people, or they couldn't do it. They're loving people. Thanks to the support of Operation Blessing Partners, volunteers are helping families with their damaged homes and also bringing much-needed hope. I would like to say to the partner, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. That thank you, that God bless you goes from Kentucky all the way to your living room, all the way to your home. As someone says how much they thank you for what you did for them. Here's a wonderful, Brenda, wonderful, great grandmother. Uh, but here she is, she's widowed. Uh, she loses everything in, a, in the flood. I love what she called, told her great-grandchildren as, as they huddled together during the storm. Well, we have each other. Isn't it wonderful to realize we can have each other? We can join together. We can be a great community of believers that says, yes, let's help people in need. Let's help people around the world. Let's gather together with the purpose of preaching good news to people to let them know that when disasters strike, we're there for them. We want to love them. We want to see them restored. If you want to be a part of all of that, join with us. Just call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, yes, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. Now, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving, the bank doing all the work. Uh, it's, it's, it's real easy to do. And we can send as our gift to you monthly teaching CDs called Power for Life. 
So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when you call, or you can go to CBN.com. When you give monthly on the internet, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. We have a new way to give where you can text CBN, those letters CBN, to 71777. You'll be directed to a giving monthly page uh, on your smartphone. And when you give monthly via text, again, you automatically sign up for Pledge Express. So do it now. Either become a regular 700 Club member at $20 a month, or you can join 700 Club Gold at, at $40 a month. And if you do it that way, you get three copies of this wonderful teaching on the Lord is my shepherd. We also have a 1,000 Club, and that's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. If you give at that level or higher, we'll send you five copies. The CD is called The Lord is My Shepherd. It's an in-depth look at Psalm 23. It's a passage of scripture that many of us know by heart. And in this new teaching, you'll discover the full meaning of each verse. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Out in the Atlantic, Tropical Storm Fiona is set to disrupt what's been a quiet season so far. Puerto Rico is bracing for 65 mile an hour winds and heavy rain Sunday. The storm is then expected to pass over Haiti and the Dominican Republic early next week. Then it turns north and is predicted to stay clear of the eastern coast of the United States. Operation Blessing is changing lives in India and all over the world. Baby Ruvina had a spinal defect that threatened to take her life. Her father struggled to find a way to help his daughter while still providing for his family as a day laborer. When Operation Blessing staff learned of the situation, they rushed in to help. Baby Ruvina underwent surgery to remove the mass. Now she is out of the danger and the family is thankful for all the help they received. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to OB.org. No one knew the pressure Morgan was under. Not her husband, not her kids, and certainly not her church. For years, she struggled with deep depression and anxiety. And then one day, she grabbed a razor to end her life. My name is Morgan Hart. I am married to Anthony Hart. We've been married for 18 years. We have three amazing children. We have four dogs. I know that sounds crazy. And we run a church here in Chesapeake, Virginia called Greenbrier Community Church. And I'm also a web and creative designer for um, Fit and Faith Media. In the fall of 2013, I took over the children's pastor position at the church we were attending. Everything was going great, and I had been in that role for a few weeks, and it was about Thanksgiving of that year. I um, was visiting family, and I was at the gym, and all of a sudden had this rushing feeling of complete loss of control, um, anxiety. I didn't know what was happening. My vision got blurry, and it lasted for about 15 minutes, and I finally was able to calm myself down. That was not the answer I wanted. Honestly, I wanted something to be wrong with my heart because I felt like that could be controlled and fixed and monitored. A lot of times we think about pastors and people with titles having everything together and their life is perfect. Nobody really knew what was going on because I kept it all inside for that shame and disappointment and just not wanting to let anybody know what was going on. January of 2014 is really when the panic attacks and the anxiety spiraled into depression that I, I don't even have words to describe how it was. Just complete in bed. I think I lost around 30 pounds. I wasn't eating. I really wasn't sleeping. I wasn't much of a mother, a pastor at that point, although I did show up every single Sunday morning and did my job. Nobody knew what I was going through, um, not even my husband. I didn't feel like my husband would understand what I was going through. Honestly, at that point, I figured they thought I was crazy. I had thoughts and visions of, sorry. <sighs> even though it's been all these years, it's still hard to talk about. I could not hear from God. I felt like he was, had left me as well. I just made the decision that my family was better off without me. I was in the bathroom and 
decided at that moment to take my razor and knelt on the bathroom floor. And I remember thinking to myself, like, God, where are you? I need you right now. If you do not come, I am going to take my life and let my family go on without having to deal with me. I can still feel the razor against my skin every time I talk about it. As the razor was on my skin, I felt this warmth come around me and the razor just dropped. Felt this complete warmth um, take over, like a bear hug, like somebody was behind me bear hugging me. I just started weeping and crying out and I could feel him again. And I think, I truly feel that that was God holding on to me and letting me know that he was there with me and that it wasn't the end and that I needed to keep on fighting. After that um, bathroom floor experience, I began opening up and letting my husband in, letting him know how I was feeling. Once I opened up to my husband, things changed and he was there for me. He fought with me and never left. And it was still months of just trying to control my mind and learn how to take those thoughts um, captive. One night I was sleeping and I was sleeping very hard. <laughs> and I remember having this such a vivid dream and I was in a dark room. It was just me walking by myself and I could hear God. I could feel that same um, like bear hug sensation in this dream. And I remember seeing this light off in the distance and um, in the dream I could hear God clearly tell me to walk towards the light. And so as I got closer to the light, it was not just a light, it was a flame. He told me to go closer. And as I started getting closer, um, I could see that there was some type of form, like thing curled up on the ground, covered in the flames. It looked like a fiery creature, like a, a demon of some sort curled up. He told me to put my foot on top of it. As I put my foot on top of it, he told me never again will I have to experience what I went through. I immediately woke up after that. The fight in me grew even harder because I knew that I was not gonna let the enemy win. I still deal with the thoughts. I've learned how to, to take them captive. Every time that I would feel depression come on, any anxiety, any panic attacks, I literally start to laugh. Isolation is the enemy's number one tool um, to get you alone, to get you by yourself, to let you believe all the lies that he's telling you. So letting people in on your story and letting people know what you're feeling is the, the road to healing. Going through depression, um, anxiety, it really gets you into a place of isolation and feeling like you're alone and fearful of just being able to share your story with others. My healing and my fight came more when I shared. It took a long time to get to this point, and you can see that it still affects me in many ways. But as the years have gone, um, I've been able to walk through situations with people that um, I walk through. To keep fighting, that God has so much in store, that your family needs you and loves you and wants you, even if um, you don't feel that way. The beauty that comes from the ashes is indescribable. So keep fighting. You know, the statistics today on the number of people who experience depression and or anxiety are raging. Uh, I think very often Morgan's story is like so many and maybe yours. You know, this is a battle that goes on inside of us, in our minds, in our hearts. It involves our thoughts and our feelings, things that other people can't necessarily see. I hope if you're struggling with this that you'll hear what Morgan said about the significance of sharing what you're going through with someone. Make sure it's someone who cares about you deeply and is willing to walk that journey with you, but also understand whose you are. You know, knowing our God, knowing who He is and knowing who we are in Him is the strongest, the strongest tool that we have to fight the enemy. We have an enemy. He's very real. He's very real. And he loves to disrupt our lives with this kind of turmoil inside. God is omnipresent. He's always with you. 
He's omniscient. He knows everything about you, including what's going on in your heart and your mind. He's all powerful and he is there to make a difference in your life. Invite Jesus Christ into the midst of the turmoil you might be facing. Get help from people who know how to help you and will listen to what you're dealing with. And if you'd like some information on what the Word of God has to say about having freedom from anxiety, we have a resource paper. We'd love to send it to you, but it's much bigger than that. Get people to help you who know how to help you. Here's the first Peter word for you today. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. God bless you.